Hi everyone, this is Howard. Welcome to another Star Talk Tuesday. This Tuesday being May 19th, 2020. Now, <clears throat> this week uh, I'd like to cut straight to one day. Now we could look at the sky any day of this week, of course, but uh, this particular week uh, on May 22nd, uh, this Friday we'll have, is the new moon. And the new moon always presents the best opportunity to look up in the sky. Uh, as a consequence of the new moon, there's no light of the moon in the dark sky, and so to, you know, if you think of this in a logical way, you're going to get as dark as your sky can possibly be, naturally speaking. Now, that, of course, doesn't alleviate any natural or uh, man-made light pollution, of course, but uh, if you're in a dark country sky, you won't have any full moon or even partial moon to challenge your ability to see things, faint objects in the sky. So from an observer's perspective, this is the best night of the month to look, and so that's this Friday, the night that everyone gets to stay up late. Anyway, uh, and as a matter of fact, as you look up there, if you're looking on the screen, there's the sun, and you'll look, there's the, now don't, I don't of course, you, I, you can't do this in real life, and I don't recommend anyone ever look up at, at the sun directly, but in the program here, you can simulate the view, and as you can see, right there is that little black dot that represents where the moon is in the sky, and this is what we refer to as the moon, new moon. This represents a, a sort of a, a little geometric arrangement here called a syzygy. It's a three-way alignment of celestial bodies in this case. As we look from farthest away, it's the sun, and then the moon, and then us. And, the, and that three-way alignment called a syzygy is what we call a new moon. Two weeks later, you get another syzygy, you get another three-way alignment, except it's now the sun, the earth, and the moon. And as the sun is setting, the moon is rising, and at that point you have what we call a full moon. So here, the opposite, we get a new moon. And so, uh, if you can't see it in the real sky, you'll know it's there, and as the, as the sun is setting, it's taking the moon with it, meaning there's no moon to obstruct our sky. So let's go ahead and get into that dark sky. Take that to right about there. There we go. I'm going to drag our view over here into the west. Bring that time ahead. There we go. Just above the tree there, we see Venus pop into view. And I know we've been seeing Venus for a while. This is an old companion. Uh, but this companion is going away, at least for the season. And as we look, our, our uh, constant companion Venus has a companion of, of her own. And there's Mercury. Uh, the two inner planets are found relatively close to each other. This Friday, as you look after the setting sun goes down, uh, you'll notice the faint glow of Mercury. Now, many of us don't notice this. In fact, Mercury is the planet that not about 90% of the human population will never knowingly observe. I say that's because, well, this is the planet closest to the sun. And while they don't notice Mercury, what they do notice is the sun. And as the sun sets, arguably one of the most observed celestial events, you could say, uh, as the sun goes down, people are watching and frequently what's in the view and they don't notice it, is that it's Mercury. Now, while not necessarily any more visible than it would be at any other time, it happens to be very close to an object that is noticeable, and that's Venus. And so by being able to locate Venus, it gives us an opportunity to point out where Mercury is and you can compare the two visually. Now, as we look very closely at Venus, we can take this into a telescopic view, I'm going to go ahead and pause time here for a moment. We're seeing here Venus looks like a f just the thinnest of clippings of a fingernail here. That's the faintest little crescent there, making the Venus look like uh, one of the moon and it's the moon in one of its phases. Uh, this is a consequence of, of Venus essentially doing what the moon is right now, uh, or on Friday anyway, which is that it's becoming a new moon. In this case, Venus is like a runner on a circular track. We're running. Well, Venus is on the inside track, and as it goes around, it's passing us. And so at this moment, it's just about to pass us. And of course, as it passes us, it will be aligned with the Earth and the Sun. And of course, if you look to the sky and you try to see Venus, it'll be when the Sun is in the sky, and, or relatively close to it, you won't notice it. And of course, there'll be no visible disk on Venus, or no visible part of it, because then all the light will be landing on the part we can't see. Just like the new moon, you could call this a a new Venus when that occurs. So anyway, we're very close to that point and we just see this faintest of slivers. Venus is very close to becoming, well, not visible in the early evening sky and it will transition back across the face of the sun and then will pop out in our morning sky and Venus will become the morning star. 
and again an opportunity to see Mercury very close by. This is a very very challenging object under telescopic conditions to try to magnify uh, but it under binoculars you'd be able to make out its relatively consistent if not overtly bright light. Okay let's pull that view back out and shift our view gently as possible to the south there we go and now at this time of the year uh, my good friend Ed um, and I both wait anxiously for this time of the year to get an opportunity to look at a deep southern object that if you were pretty much anywhere else in the United States the continental United States anyway you wouldn't be able to see this because it sits for us anyway in Florida it's about 15 degrees above the southern horizon so it sits oh, from this perspective it sits right about here above the southern horizon so if you go too far north you are not going to be able to see it as it is for us it's a relatively challenging object but it is one of the best objects in the sky in fact if as far as I'm concerned I would say it's it's in the top three uh, it is truly a stunning object and it is uh, if you know where to look, it is actually not that challenging a thing to see. It doesn't require a really expensive telescope to see. In fact, all you need are eyes. In fact, uh, it bears a stellar designation because it was visible to the naked eye. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to stop blathering on. Let's go ahead and accelerate our clock to a nice dark time. And there we go. Actually, let's go a little bit further. There we go, right about there. So we're about a quarter to 11. And as we look, we're looking into the southern sky, and you can see, if I pull this out further, there we go, you can see that there is the glow of the Milky Way galaxy coming up, and this is one of those most stellar rich regions of the sky. We're gonna take a look along this little area right here first, and then we're gonna jump up into this part of the sky right there around Spica there in uh, Virgo. Uh, so, really quickly, let's go ahead and get that artwork up, revealing where things are in the sky, and of course there we see all our constellations. This is the one I want to go into. This is our object, 15 degrees above the horizon. It's found in Centaurus here, as we zoom in. Uh, Centaurus here, of course, half man, half horse. Uh, Centaurus here looks like uh, he's simultaneously tickling and spearing Lupus the wolf here. Uh, in some mythological art, Lupus is actually portrayed as having been speared by Centaurus. In other cases, they're just simply separate constellations. It's kind of interesting how they interpret that. In any case, uh, Centaurus here, uh, half man, half horse, is the location of our object called Omega Centauri. Now, what I, what I mean by Omega Centauri, meaning you're probably familiar with uh, Alpha Centauri, which is not visible yet here. I think it might come up just above the horizon. Anyway, Alpha Centauri is the brightest star in the constellation of Centaurus. Well, according to Johann Baer, who created the system, Omega Centauri, the last letter in the Greek alphabet, denotes one of the bright, or the, excuse me, dimmer stars in, the, in this group. And so, seen right there. Let's get rid of this artwork. Formerly known, or known as Omega Centauri, it is also classified as something else. He thought it was a star sitting just actually let's move the clock just a little bit further let's move that about five more minutes yeah right about to there there we go it's sitting directly above and so this is at 10 minutes to 11 2250 using the 24-hour clock there we go at 2250 this object Omega Centauri is going to be sitting directly above the southern horizon the southern excuse me cardinal point and as we look what it reveals itself to be what Johann Bayer thought was a star is this gigantic lump of stars called a globular cluster. Now, as star clusters go, uh, there's two, two types, typically speaking, uh, open clusters and globular clusters. Now, open clusters are loose associations of very young stars, typically in the numbers of, you know, tens, hundreds, perhaps thousands of stars, loosely scattered together in a relatively familial group. You can see they're physically, gravitationally associated with each other but typically in the thousands. These kind of star clusters, globular, contain hundreds of thousands of stars, and they're not very young. They're ancient. These stars are about 12 billion years old. 
they're as old as the Milky Way galaxy. In fact, it is there's about 200 or so, maybe 150 of these uh, globular clusters that orbit the Milky Way, as well as other galaxies out there. In fact, uh, there's a lot of surveys of globular clusters orbiting the Andromeda galaxy. So um, it's almost, in, 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 a, in a context, it's like seeing remoras clinging to sharks. We see these globular clusters sort of gravitationally uh, clinging to galaxies, and they represent these dense populations of perhaps leftovers from galactic formation. And so typically numbering in the hundreds of thousands of stars, this particular one is like I like to call it the granddaddy of them all. Omega Centauri has over 10 million stars, and so to the naked eye you can actually see it if your sky is dark enough and you don't have any light pollution. You gotta remember the challenge is also the atmosphere because are relatively low in the sky. but pair of binoculars really makes this thing jump into view and and, uh, and, of, and of course telescopes really afford you something truly spectacular. Uh, this is a real gem in the sky because uh, with increasing power um, you can just see the, the enormity of that grouping of stars and you start to see the scale and uh, it, it's, it's, it's mentally when you understand what you're looking it's mind-boggling. Anyway about 15,000 light years away we're looking right through the Milky Way's sort of thin veneer of stars right here, relatively speaking, there's the central bulge. We're looking through this relatively thin section of stars right here, right out into a distant orbit out in the halo, 15,000 light years above the plane of the galaxy. That's where we see Omega Centauri. Okay, now, let's go ahead. Oh, actually, how did I overlook this? Before we jump out of Centaurus, there's Omega Centauri. You'll notice right above, almost in a straight line, remember, just below us, it's the south cardinal point. There's the south cardinal point. In a straight line, there's Omega Centauri. And now here, for those of you that have access to telescopes, uh, this is, uh, I believe, the fifth brightest galaxy in the sky. Uh, I think this one's about 16 million light years away. This is called Centaurus A. And it uh, represents the merger of two galaxies. One has pretty clearly been absorbed by another. And I... Uh, now, I'm going to try and back this out so you can see and see the name, the label they give it. There it is. Centaurus A. And this made me laugh because I'd never heard of this before or heard it called this before, but it's called the Hamburger Galaxy. Now, as you get close, you can kind of see why. What we see looks clearly like a, maybe a bun here and a big... That would be hard to wrap your mouth around that burger. That's, and that would be a really thin patty. I, when I see this in the sky, what I see is an oval and a sort of a dark patch that kind of cuts right through it. It always reminds me of an egg wearing a, a beauty pageant sash. Uh, but, uh, well, that perhaps sounds like, some, like a little bit of absurd elegance there. I like the hamburger galaxy because it's kind of comical in its notion as well. Anyway, uh, Centaurus A uh, and Omega Centauri, a double whammy of objects in the deep southern sky that, relatively speaking, uh, they essentially do this, kind of like a dolphin jumping out of the water. They jump out of the water and they go back into the water. And uh, relatively speaking right here, excuse me, uh, those two objects are at their highest point in their arc above like the dolphin going through the air. That's as high as they'll get in the sky. So uh, that's your best oppor opportunity to see them. And on a moonless night, you definitely want to jump on that. Now, over here, I'm going to drag this guy over here and uh, pull it over this way. And I'm going to put on the artwork again just to reveal a little group of constellations here that have a lot of fun, mythologically speaking. It's a lot of fun to, to show the kids if you can see these stars. But they're connected with well, these three right here. This one, I don't wonder why it's flickering. This one, this one, and this one. I'm going to throw up their labels. I'm, I'm not trying to be intentionally difficult here, but I want to, I don't want to give away anything too early, so we'll put their labels up. There we go. There's Hydra, Crater, and Corvus. Well, in the common tongue, that would mean the water snake, the cup, and the crow. Uh, and this is a fun little story. If you're familiar with the story of uh, Apollo, Apollo one day is uh, making a sacrifice to Zeus, performing some ritual for Zeus, and he needs water. And so he sends the crow, who happened to be near the temple, he sends the crow with the cup, or crater. Now, crater in Greek is this large bowl-like mixing bowl that would contain fluids that would be typically mixed together. 
uh, and it, you know, ironically, we call craters of that same similar bowl-like structure on the surface of the moon and planetary bodies. But it's, it's largely, it was from a, the Greek word crater with a K, uh, a, this giant bowl. Anyway, in, 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 the, in the myth, Corvus took the cup or the bowl to fly off to a water source and get water for Apollo. Anyway, on his way there, he happens to fly over a grove of figs, and he sees these beautiful but unripe figs and decides he's going to wait for those figs to ripen and eat them. So he waits a couple of days for those figs to ripen, and when they do, he enjoys himself and indulges on the figs. And of course, Apollo has to continue the ritual without the water, and subsequently the crow realizes that he's now got to explain himself, so he finds a water snake, and he grabs the water snake in its claws, and he flies back to Apollo and says, I couldn't get the water, because this water snake was blocking me. And of course, Apollo could see right through the lie, and in his anger, threw Corvus, the cup, and the water snake all into the sky in such a way that Corvus would be punished with eternal thirst amongst the heavens, never to ever, never able to quench his thirst because the cup is just out of reach, and the water snake prevents Corvus from ever quenching his thirst as they bounce along the back of the water snake. In any case, a uh, fun little story, but we can all also connect that to an interesting modern myth. So here in Corvus, it's this little quadrilateral shape here. For those of you that are comic book fans, you'll appreciate this. So this little quadrilateral of stars here represents Corvus, and it's that's pretty easy to find. I think this, actually, when you find it in the sky, you realize you've been seeing it for a while. Um, I'm going to put the artwork up there for just a moment. We're going to zoom in right here. I'm going to take this to... Well, this is going to take me a moment to find, and so I'm going to type it in. And it doesn't like that name. It gives it something else. There it is right there. I knew it was close by. Now, here in, in this catalog, it's called LP73432. And, and you're looking at it going, if I, if I click off of it, you can't even see anything. There's nothing there. In fact, if I zoom in, you still can't see anything. And if you click anywhere else on the screen, it won't show you anything. But if I happen to click right there, it actually knows there's an object there. Well, that happens to be a real red dwarf star called LHS 2520. And if you were curious about its connection to comic books, well, that's the star that Krypton orbits. That's Superman's home star system. If you didn't know that, 42 light years away, that's a real star. Now, that was written right into the comic book. So uh, if you uh, ever want to point out to the sky and know where Superman comes from, well, right up there above Guiana in Corvus, in that little quadrilateral found right between the crow and the cup and the snake and the centaur, deep in our southern sky. Anyway, I know I could babble on all night long, but I've run out of time again. So thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time at another Star Talk Tuesday.